Rob Bruner is the Senior Manage Managing Director with FTI Consulting. Uh, he leads both their, uh, the FTI Consulting Residential Mortgage Backed Securities Litigation Practice Group and the company's Global Financial and Enterprise Data Analytics Practice. He's based in San Francisco. He's a nationally recognized expert in collection and analysis of financial, transactional, and operational data. He's an expert in financial database design and management, complex data modeling, claims management and administration, and electronic discovery. He's testified in large-scale data analysis, electronic discovery, discovery management, financial fraud, and methodology development. He served clients in many industries, including the financial services, manufacturing, government, healthcare, and the telecommunications industries. And prior to joining FTI Consulting, uh, he was a partner in charge of the Class Action Complex Data Services Group for KPMG in the United States. And before joining KPMG, he was a partner in Anderson Worldwide, where he led the strategy, finance, and economics practice for the Pacific Northwest. He holds a BA in Mathematics and Computer Science from the University of California, San Diego, and a BA in Management Science from the University of California at San Diego. And importantly, his daughter Ellery, who's with us today, is a sophomore at TCU. So we're very excited. Rob Bruner, please join us. Thank you, Homer. Welcome. Again, okay, we have a lot to talk about. And again, what we we'll always would we'll, we'll do a little Q&A, and then we'll open it to the floor. Because again, there are just there's a lot of interesting information. But why don't you start off and tell us about FTI Consulting. So who is that, or what's that company? What's that organization about? And what kind of things do you do? So FTI is a, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, FTI is a, an organization, it's a public company treated on the New York Stock Exchange, about 4,000 professionals, 5,000 um, employees globally. And we help companies through sort of business events, business crises. Uh, they can be bankruptcies, lawsuits, regulatory inquiries, um, mergers, acquisitions, divestitures, those sorts of things. So o overall, organizationally, we work to help companies through those bumps in the road to those transitions that help them, that are impactful in either how they grow, how they interface with their regulators, how they uh, conduct themselves as they enter new markets, what have you. And, and particularly, largely, it's trying to remove the barriers, the organizational barriers to them, to them progressing. Mm -hmm. So it's usually event-driven, caused by some external force, a, a regulatory inquiry, a lawsuit. A, 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 quite often, a, it's a an SEC investigation, a, mm -hmm. a DOJ investigation, that sort of thing, or a major lawsuit with a competitor or a former business partner, something like that. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when we hear the word consulting, people think, well, we're going to do some really fun management things to help people feel better about themselves or whatever, right? And well, you probably make people feel better about themselves. Um, By relieving but it, pain, hopefully. But, it, but yeah. at, a different, <laughs> at a different way. So, so how do you spend your time uh, in, in, in the company? Okay, so. so I, my, my part of the business, the two main parts you alluded to, one is residential mortgage-backed securities. That's sort of a part of the business that has grown over the last several years as a result of, of the, um, the financial crisis in 2008. Um, the other part that's more of my, my time is leading our global data analytics business. And that is in helping all parts of our business identify and leverage the information that's resident in companies to help them solve these problems or address these problems. Because with the explosion of data, <clears throat> excuse me, with the explosion of data out there today in across all aspects of business from manufacturing to hiring to, to every customer interaction, what have you do, their accounting transactions and their, their communications up and down the supply chain. There is so much more information generated and stored today that never existed 20 years ago, 25 years ago, maybe even five years ago. So we work to help companies identify where that relevant data is and how to extract that and how to leverage that to help solve that business problem. Be that again, be that the the, the bankruptcy or the dispute, because there's always any kind of business dispute, any kind of business friction, with a with a competitor, or a supplier, or a, um, a a regulator. There's always data underneath that someplace, and so we work to help them find that and figure out how to leverage that to help provide the answers to the problem. So where does the data come from? Oh, systems ac across the board. Uh, HR systems, you know, general ledger systems, 
supply chain systems, uh, customer interaction systems, point of sale systems, web systems, logs. A lot of our, our uh, pattern analytics are, are driven from, from log activity where we, we look at uh, customer interactions, that sort of thing. But depending on the nature of the dispute, there's, there's data there someplace. Quite often it's coming out of their, their ERP systems, their Oracle systems, their SAP systems, uh, particularly as it relates to dealing with, with regulators. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, but it's, you can't touch a company now without leaving some digital footprint, right? Mm -hmm. Every, everywhere you go, there's, sure. there's some, some trail, some trace. So how big is big data? When we, when we, what's the scale that we're talking about? Well, well there are, there are, you know, <clears throat> big is relative and big data is, is defined by not just the size, but also the scale, the speed, the, the, the the, the velocity with which that data is flowing through the organization and with which the, the, the need for analysis is, is applied. Um, we've worked with clients with terabytes and terabytes of data. We've also designed, uh, quote, big data solutions for something as small as several gigabytes of data flowing through, but with a great variety of different data coming through. So big is, what well, when you talk about big in terms of the size of the actual data, or when you talk about big as the size of the phenomenon, it is a very large phenomenon out there in the industry. Mm -hmm. And there is, a, there is there's a majority of companies that have any sort of customer interaction at all, business to business, maybe not quite as much, but certainly business to consumer, mm -hmm. that have customer interactions that way. There's a, a massive amount of, of data points and a massive variety of data points that are flowing through that organization that they're using constantly, if they're doing it appropriately, to fine tune that customer interaction. Mm -hmm. So I know a lot of the work you do is in, involves litigation in yeah. some way. Yeah. So where, where do you enter in? Is it, a, uh, do you, is it on the front end? Do you, are you brought in? Uh, you know, where do you, what role do you play in that, that process? <clears throat> You know, one way to look at that, we, we are involved, we broadly are involved in a lot of the stuff you see on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Um, I did a quick scan of the journal this morning, and usually if you read column A1, there's at least one of our clients or one of the industries with which we're very active right now in that first, in that first column. Mm -hmm. Today there was discussion, for example, around the uh, closure of Full Tilt Poker and FanDuel. Um, by, I think it was the, I'm not sure if it's the New York DFS or the, the DOJ. Um, I won't talk to what we're doing exactly there because we have some, some um, uh, confidentiality going on. But when the same exact process happened for the online gaming industry, for, full, uh, for the, um, uh, the poker stars industry, the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the online poker, uh, we were very involved from the outset in working with the company and the, and the department um, at that time, it was the Department of Justice, and this is public record, so I can talk about this, and it's, mm -hmm. it's, we're long past. Uh, but in helping provide a level of monitorship and oversight of the company, that they were not transgressing any of the strict restrictions that the DOJ had put on them. So we were involved not in the initial inquiry, but in helping the company respond to the inquiry and to build a plan to help them be able to keep the, the DOJ at bay. So very early on, oftentimes it's, it's helping the company respond. Sometimes it's helping them figure out what the problem was. Mm -hmm. uh, a client we're working with uh, right now had, a, um, had a, a, a systems problem that caused major operational unrest to their business. Um, caught, effectively shut down one of their core services that they were providing to their customers for, for over a week. And um, they needed to be able to respond to their customers how do, we, how do we guarantee you this won't happen again? How do we know what the root cause was? How do we know that we're pursuing all possible you know, claims against our providers and what have you uh, to ensure that, that you know, your interests are protected, what have you? And so that was one, a situation where we're involved actually in figuring out what happened, that initial incident response. So very early on in the process, we got a call mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, virtually the next day to help figure out what happened, what was the problem, what was the extent of the problem, what was the vulnerability that was exploited, how do, we, how do we keep that from being exploited again? How do we patch that hole, that sort of thing? So it kind of touches, crosses a little bit into the mm -hmm, mm -hmm. cyber review type stuff, cybersecurity type review. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also closely connected because all the cybersecurity reviews are all 
analysis of data. Sure. It's all analysis sure. of, of system logs and, and you know, either terminal logs and upgrade logs and systems of logs, et cetera. So it's all analysis of data. So as, as complex as the supply chain is now, um, do you have do you find times where a client you're working with is not was well, having trouble with a former client? Do you ever have those kinds of issues, and how do you deal with those kind of complexities? Because the supply chain is so interconnected. It, uh, yeah. the, the su supply chain is <laughs> extremely interconnected, and the, their reliance on one another for for valid and accurate data as well passes mm -hmm. through, through as you know as as inventory or work in process passes through the, the supply chain, the nodes are coming so much more closely connected and the need for reliable information up and down that chain becomes so much more connected that the, the chain itself is vulnerable to blips or breakdowns at any point along that chain. And so we're now seeing increasingly you know, companies needing to focus on building redundancy outside of what they would normally expect is not just redundancy at a particular node for a particular client, but you know that we have, have alternative ways of getting not just the, the product delivered, mm -hmm. but also the, the data about that product, what have you. Mm -hmm. um, because there is such a close connectivity at this point in time, and there's so much information being passed. There's, in, in some contexts, actually, the, the, the information about the transaction is more valuable than the transaction itself. Mm -hmm. Because it tells us so much more about you know where things are going and what the latencies are and what the holdups are, and we can see some of that in the actual the, the data around the transaction, long before we can see the interruption in the actual physical goods. So is, if you will, is your big data some the same as if you will the op opposing parties' big data? Or are they different at times? The the, the big data they bring to the table for the particular instance? I think the interpretation is, is sometimes inconsistent, mm -hmm. but particularly in the world of, of, speaking primarily in the US here, in the world of a US litigation environment or a regulatory environment, there's a pretty good effort to be sure that both sides are playing with the same set of information, same deck of cards, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, but there's always room for interpretation. And the, it, oftentimes it's that, just as if you're in the marketing side, that slight nuanced idea of how to reinterpret data can provide a competitive advantage or can provide an alternative and you know, new and creative way of, of marketing to a specific segment of customers. In the context of a dispute or an issue with the government, a slightly alternative perspective on how to view that data and how to interpret that data can go a long way toward either advancing the ball or advancing the cause, that sort of thing. So you're speaking to the difference then, really between big data and analytics and what you're doing with that data, right? So how, how do we, can you talk to us a little bit about what's the difference in when we, you hear the term big data and then you hear analytics? Now what's, what, what's different about those? So, so analytics is a much broader, a much, much broader um, concept. And it's, in, I'll, I'll distinguish a little bit just by sort of touching on the highlight, the, the highlighting the things that distinguish big data from, broadly big data from business analytics in general. Mm -hmm. and, and that is sort of the, the, oftentimes the ad hoc nature and the instantaneous nature of big data analytics, the volume and the velocity of the data coming through the pipe mm -hmm. and the, the use of that data to tailor a particular customer experience, for example, or um, tailor a specific advertising that's promulgated to a customer via a website or what have you, or determine which, all the way down to which, which coupons get printed out at the cash register when they're walking out of the out of the uh, the grocery store. The looking at the immediacy of all of the information available, be that through through customer behavior logs and the, you know, what they clicked on immediately prior, et cetera, uh, their prior buying patterns. That is a much more broad bucket of dealing instantaneously with that data coming in. That's sort of big data, right? And mm -hmm. You're dealing with mm -hmm. business analytics is much more focused on helping using using the all of the existing data, but using for the most part the, the core reliable operational data available to the company to make sound business decisions. Not necessarily tailored for each individual customer, but what's our what are our higher profitability 
products? How do we place them in the store? Um, you know, who are our most profitable customers? How do we segment the, to those customers? Um, you know, which, what are our most profitable supply chains? Right? Mm -hmm. How do we how do we tailor our supply chain information? Our, our supply chains and our, our business partners, our, our um, suppliers, so that we're getting you know, the right the right inventory to the right locations at the right time, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That's that data doesn't doesn't shift as dramatically. It's not a daily, instantaneous sort of analysis, um, but it's core to virtually every operation the company entertains at this point. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. There is not a business transaction that goes on anymore. As I mentioned earlier, that's not logged, doesn't leave a, a footprint, and and B that there's not a, a, a substantial amount of analysis that can be applied to that transaction and other in the context of other transactions to figure out how to either make more money on that, you know, cross-sell to other products, um, you know, find ways of delivering that good more cost-effectively, find ways of pricing that product more profitably, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the analytics is a much broader umbrella, yes. right, that we apply and we use, you know, that can range also to building dashboards for executives so that they can look at their portfolio of, of distribution centers or of their, their real to out, retail outlets, what have you. That's that's more traditional business analytics, where we're building you know complex visualizations on top and helping them understand the the levers that are driving the profitability of the business and the expandability of the business, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. as opposed to to big data, which for the most part is using more is currently being used more sort of to tailor to the individual customer okay. experience. So, <clears throat> I guess not exclusively, but right. most often, at least right, right now, in the, in the marketing scheme. So I presume, like everyone else in this room, there's a lot of information on me out in the world, um, and a lot of information out there. Uh, so when you think about ethics issues in your, in your world, I, you know, there was a recent, fairly recent story where Target was, uh, I think we probably all saw the story where Target was um, watching the, the buying patterns of a teenage girl and was sending coupons for diapers and things to her house, and uh, the father didn't think that was a good idea, uh, confronted Target, and then a little bit later, I guess his daughter was pregnant um, with that. So it was, you know, there was a lot of information out there. When you think about the use of data, do you worry about the ethical, the ethics of how the data is being used, or how do you, where does it fit in your, in your world? There's a depends on the on the specific use right I mean I think it, all that information that target had um, certainly is valid for them to look at but there, there's certainly a gray line in terms of how specifically and maybe there should be gray areas or boxes of you, know, you can't use this customer information to profile in this category or in that category um, but for the most part consumers have recognized, and are accepting that the more tailored the advertising presented to you, the better for you, and the less likely you are to object to the use of data to tailor that use of data, you know, in your in your behalf. It's much mm -hmm. much better for you to get then you know coupons for you know ties and shaving cream mm -hmm. than and not children's bicycles or, sure. or what have you, right? Mm -hmm. And a broad, there's a broad study I read. Uh, but a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, I forget where, I can't source it, um, that, that showed that in the grand trade-off between sort of privacy and tailorization, that at least in the U.S., um, contrary to all protections that, that you might think, consumers are willing to give up a little bit on privacy in favor of personalization of the delivery of you know, coupons, products, recommendations, what have you. It, mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting trade-off. There is certainly a great gray area out there, mm -hmm. without question. Um, the, the, the further risk it, that we have is when customers don't sort of adequately protect that data, <clears throat> not necessarily the inferences they draw, but the raw data itself sure. on customers' buying patterns. And, and you know, there is a lot of concern about, about moderating and reselling of that data to third parties. Mm -hmm. um, there's some, uh, I think there was press 
Monday of this week about Bank of America deciding that it was not going to sell its data to data aggregators mm -hmm. for fear that it was being misused and, mm -hmm. and that customers weren't, weren't approving that and, and didn't fully appreciate what they were agreeing to when they clicked on the little box that said, yes, you can share it with this data aggregator. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the, the step to data aggregation and you know, those ultimate secondary and tertiary uses that you might not know about, mm -hmm. if, as soon as you sign that data away or give that data away, you've lost that control. Right. Uh, you work across industries, so yeah. it, does, it, does it matter whether it's healthcare, whether it's residential bank mortgages, in terms of the, the privacy issues, do you think that's a... There are the, sort of three broad <clears throat> categories of, of confidential information. There's, there's um, HIPAA-protected information relating to, to one's health. There's <clears throat> PII, personal identifiable information, which social security number, birth date, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. And then there's a PCI, which is card level information, credit card authorizations, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So those are the three large buckets that are largely con considered to be highly protected mm -hmm. and regulated each according to their own, their own laws and regulations or what have you. And the protections around each of them are different, mm -hmm. right? The, but, but you'll see working in the different industries, the degree to which the industries take significant steps to protect the confidentiality of that data, it, it's much, much more so than anything you would see in, in um, for example, retail industry, they take protecting the card information very seriously because that's the, the piece of personal information that they get. Sure. Right, the financial services companies, they get your, your bank accounts and, and your, um, Social security numbers and dates of birth, that sort of thing, and they take great care to protect that. Um, health insurance industry, the healthcare industry, is an order of magnitude more complex than it would be because of HIPAA protections mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the exchange of information. And every time you go to see a doctor, you have to sign a release to you say I'm authorizing to, to provide this to there. So the, the the constructs that have been put in place to limit the repurposing of that data are quite substantial at this point in time. So repurposing, there's actually some interesting, some interesting applications out there. The repurposing of that specific data out there is much more limited because of those sorts of protections. Mm -hmm. But there are some companies out there doing really good things to anonymize that data and yet make it available. There's a, a company out in the Silicon Valley, uh, Practice Fusion, which provides electronic healthcare records and they provide them to a doctor's office free mm -hmm. in exchange for paid advertising. So you know, the medical device makers may pay them to advertise, the, the pharmaceuticals may pay them to put banner ads in there, what have you. But they're providing this medical, uh, electronic, um, electronic health record, medical record, and they are, they are now in so many doctor's offices and, and um, uh, medical systems that their population of patient experiences they can anonymize <clears throat> and you can still track sort of the history of what's happening to ex patients with this diagnosis mm -hmm. and how they're being treated and what the cost of, of treatment is and what the preferred treatments are mm -hmm. without getting to oh John Doe had this particular treatment and that sort of thing mm -hmm. So they're finding creative, the market is finding creative ways outside of what the government might be trying to do. It's finding very innovative ways of, of making great value, creating great value while still trying to protect the, the patient confidentiality. I happen to find that that's a particular sort of instance that the government could never have possibly created. It would have taken mm -hmm. decades and, and thousands of pages of legislation to create something that Practice Fusion did with probably you know, $20 million of venture money. Sure, okay. And it's an extremely valuable source of information now. That's a great right. asset for absolutely. them. Absolutely, absolutely. So the, are, we, are we regulated sufficiently? I know it's gonna be different across <laughs> industries, but are we regulated sufficiently too much in, in, within the private data, our big data analytics world? I think we're, I think we're the market I think will force us to continue to, to monitor appropriately. And regulation aside, when we have a, a major breach, a, a target type breach or a Sony type breach, mm -hmm. um, that forces companies to recognize, hey, look, we need to step up. We need to step up our data privacy efforts here. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's, that has nothing to do with whether or not the, the 
DOJ is going to find them has more to do with the reaction to, to, of their consumers and of their shareholders who are punishing them for having, you know, uh, exposed the company through these breaches, that sort of thing. Okay. So and it, that's an example. You know, mm -hmm. they, there's an mm -hmm. estimate I read that I think there were over a million, or I'm sorry, over a billion for, um, individual breaches last year, breaches of customer information last year. So over a billion consumers had one aspect of their data exposed last year wow. inappropriately. Wow. So that will have to go down yeah. because customers will, because institutions will start to feel the backlash from their customers. You know, okay. Target saw a huge hit. Sure. Sony saw a huge hit as a result of their of their breaches. Right. And so that's, they're, they've stepped up their efforts quite substantially. Interesting. I want to open just a second to the audience, but uh, t talk about a little bit when you're, when you, both you, you directly, but also the FTI as a whole, when you look for uh, empl new employees, what kinds of things do you look for? Um, are there certain skills, skill sets, type? What do you look for? That's, that's, a, a, that's a great question, especially with a room that's largely populated by students. Um, the, we look for, we, in our practice area, I, I hire 20, 25 uh, undergraduates off, off campus each year. And we look for t kids typically coming out of the business school or mm -hmm. um, with, with finance, uh, can be marketing, um, business analytics, BIS, what have you. Mm -hmm. And what we're really looking for is not just the hard skills that they learned in a particular course regimen. What we really look for is their, their ability to, demonstrated ability to learn, right? They, so they've got an aptitude to pick up new things. Um, and, and they're interested in, in, I want to see that if they've taken, they've exposed themselves to a range of courses, so they're willing to try and learn different things, mm -hmm. right? If they're just taking all the softball courses, that's probably not someone who I'm going to, going to focus on. Mm -hmm. um, if they've taken the softball courses and some really tough analytic courses, that's great. I want to see that you can draw conclusions, that you can make inferences, that you can do that hard problem solving. Mm -hmm. Problem solving is very big in the consulting industry, right? That's the, mm -hmm. the, the core skill that our clients turn to us for is problem solving. And in today's day and age, given the, the range of tools that we have to bring to bear and the complexity of the underlying business transactions that we're trying to to assimilate and, and interpret, right? You, we need to have people who can, who have the strong problem solving and ability, analytic, and ability, and ability, the analytic ability, and the ability to pick up new tools to, uh, to apply to that an analysis. Right. Right. So someone who's spent their entire life and has just used Excel only is probably not a strong candidate. Someone who's reached out and has tried to explore using using other technical tools in other different areas and they were exposed mm -hmm. to SAS or R or whatever mm -hmm. else, mm -hmm. those kids are gonna be a little bit more interesting to me because they've shown also an aptitude to pick up technology and to learn how to use, apply technology to solve problems. Mm -hmm. That's the critical thing, especially in today's day and age and going forward where data is ever more prevalent in the conduct of, of business. Mm -hmm. there, you can't get away from it, it's not going anywhere. Yeah. They're, they're the only business that exists today that doesn't generate data isn't operating. <laughs> yeah. there, there are none. With that, exactly. Yeah. Let's, let, let's open to the audience. What kind of questions do you have? And again, there's a lot of business commercials. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Eugene Lim, a senior at TCU. Yeah. Yeah. TCU. Um, so another buzzword about analytics is the machine learning, like the uh, IBM Watson or the Google's new open source machine. Do you think the machine learning can change the analytic industry or, uh, or the litigation industry as well? So there's a, a large application for things like Watson, right? The, and the, the types of problems that Watson can answer are not the types of problems that we might answer in the context of a litigation or a regulatory inquiry, right? They're, they're, they're kind of almost kiosk questions, right, that, that Watson can answer. There's a, a defined population of, of data that, that Watson can go back and, and query on a regular basis and derive at the right solution. That's certainly going to steer a lot of how, I think, decisions are made in, in certain applications of the economy, but there are places where, where it's not gonna be able to make a difference, not, not a meaningful difference. 
Um, be, and that's largely because of the, either the, the data is too, too much in flux uh, or in contest, or the sort of the contours and the context of the, the dispute and the, the, or the issue trying to be resolved are so narrow that it would take more time to program into Watson than it would to solve it directly, right? It's a, it's a great solution. Um, and it's a great solution for things, you know, the questions. I, I enjoyed my trip to Europe last year. You know, where should I go on my vacation next year? Watson's going to actually give you probably a decent answer to that kind of thing, right? What are the attributes come back? What are the attributes of, that you liked in your vacation to Europe, et cetera, et cetera? And Watson can come back with some good, solid recommendations. I, 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 without oversimplifying, it's kind of like the Amazon book recommendations, right? If you like this, mm -hmm. you might like that sort of thing. Sure. Um, but, but that's not going to be applicable to the entire industry of, of business analytics. And, and Watson does not make business analytics go away. Machine learning does not make business analytics go away. Actually, it increases the demand for business analytics professionals who can figure out how to interpret, apply, program, and, and leverage those technologies to make businesses smarter. To, to help enable businesses to make smarter decisions. Those, those technologies don't make decisions by themselves in a vacuum. There's a, a massive amount of work necessary to configure and, and to promote and to, um, to, to make it specific enough to the business, first of all, to the industry at large, then to the specific business problem that's, that's trying to be analyzed. So I do think it will transform, they'll both transform the, the movement of where business analysis progresses, but not not overnight, it's a 10-year it's a change, and not across the entire industry, but it will certainly, I think, probably tweak or, or over the next maybe three to five years, begin to change the emphasis of where, where business analytics people, it'll create new sectors of, new parts of demand for where we further explore more niche areas of business analytics professionals. Right, the field is constantly growing. The field of business analytics 15 years ago barely existed. Now it's, the, I think, the fastest growing population of new um, uh, job titles out there mm -hmm. is something, something in the business analytics field. It'll continue to grow. So when you, you know, as an economist, Milton Friedman used to say it really was, wasn't important how accurate theory or hypotheses were. It's only if it acted as if it was accurate. <laughs> and so it's really what the data said. But as, when you look at big data versus anal and analytics, mm -hmm. it's it really kind of your question, Yun. Is big data really backwards looking? So it, it, it seems to me the value in predicting, in big data's prediction, is for today, based upon the past, but based on today, so long as conditions don't change, the fundamentals change. Mm -hmm. if, if they change, it seems like, is that where analytics has to come and, and in? And it's constantly changing, by the yeah, way, right? Yeah. That, that profile, even, even if you use, <clears throat> say, predictive analytics, let's, let's um, uh, create customer segmentations. We've identified our half a dozen different buckets of customers. Um, we've used predictive analytics to identify, to try and target new individual products into their, what we're, either buckets of products or types of products or classes of products that we think would be relevant to them. Mm -hmm. um, those, those segmentations, for example, constantly change as, as the, the buying patterns continue to accumulate and we learn more and we may be able to, to dice more finely and to make next recommendations, more refined recommendations. Mm -hmm. But even those customer interactions, every, every action you make today reinforms what the next prediction is going to be. Mm -hmm. and, and may reinterpret, well, maybe you're making the transition from uh, one of the, your guests last year used uh, customer segmentation to talk about the, the, the you don't want to rent a, uh, rent a house to a bunch of frat boys, right. <laughs> a, a bunch of, a bunch of sure. fraternity girls you probably don't want to. You really want to rent to the 25 to 36-year-old mm -hmm. women because they're the ones who are actually making it the, the CEO of HomeAway. Right? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, those That's the bucket of people who you really want to be making Sure. making, um, uh, targeting your sales to, what have you, right? Mm -hmm. Well, people move through that demographic, and that demographic over time, as the millennials, you talked about that, as the millennials progress and their buying habits change, they move uh, sort of out of Airbnb into v VRBO sort of thing. Sure, sure. So the, the market dynamics are constantly changing that you, you need to constantly be adapting this. Yeah. 
predictive analytics are, are very helpful, but they're they're not they're not finite. They don't yeah. they, the, the universe doesn't end. <laughs> yeah, with that. Right. Yep. Other questions? Yes. You know, I haven't specifically looked for that. I, ha I haven't I haven't seen that. And of the types of cases that I've seen come up, that hasn't hasn't arisen. Um, you know, we do find we we deal mostly in the context with, with which we're interacting. We're either helping customers frame or our clients frame their customer experience, in which case the 72 page, you know, eight point font thing is, it goes away completely or you, you summarize it to a point where it's not an intrusive situation or we're dealing more with, with business to business transactions and there every word of that disclosure is going to be read. In a business to business context, you know, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a contract <laughs> and every word of that is being, is being read and reviewed and it has been read and reviewed um, and you, you wouldn't try and promote in that context an overly aggressive contract, you'd never do, never do business again. So I haven't seen where the, the 99 cent transaction gives rise to a, a million dollar exposure. <laughs> not saying it is impossible, but I, I haven't seen that. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, I think Apple would be smart enough not to, not to do that though, generally. Yeah, yeah. They've Interest, uh, actually, that's a very interesting. One of my uh, business partners here, David Lasseter, um, we did a case not that long ago for, uh, uh, and actually it's public record, I can, I can talk about it, uh, for the American Express Travel uh, Insurance Program. And so there's a, con a construct in which the, when, you, when you first get your American Express card or when you first agree to sign up for the American Express travel insurance, which you, you buy your plane ticket on your Amex card, if something happens, bad weather, you need to cancel, what have you, you've got insurance in place to cover the cost of that, et cetera, right? Um, they, you enter into that agreement though once and only once and you agree to a 999 or 1999 per transaction engagement and that goes on until you provide notice to Amex that you want to back out. You don't want to do that anymore. So in that construct, American Express, over the, over the, over the life of your contract, American Express is going to make a ton of money if you travel a lot. Um, the, the exposure of the company to you is limited to a thousand bucks or a couple thousand bucks per, per transaction. But over the long run, you're making a recurring commitment to spend, it could be thousands of dollars with them. Um, when, when that got litigated about the, the recurring nature of that charge and the customer's notification, American Express was completely supported. They, they won on summary judgment that you, know, you, you agreed once, the materiality of that transaction relative to the, the amount of the insurance was irrelevant. Um, and that was a context construct in which there was, it's a multi-page 18 page agreement, that sort of thing, that you were expected to sign. That's not the little click box, just say yes, but it was an actual 18 page agreement, I think, that you had to, had to sign and agree to. Interesting. Yep. Yes. All the way back? All the way back. All the way back. Hi, I'm Greg. I wonder if you would talk a little bit about the right to be forgotten and how oh. that might be implemented in the United States and what you think about what the European Union is doing and how that might affect our companies knowing that we're all globally connected. And I'll take my answer offline. <laughs>
<laughs> it's the worst idea ever, honestly. <laughs> the, the, the whole, the, the, so I'm not, I'm not current with exactly where it is, but I understand the latest argument is that, that the Googles at all want to say, you can be forgotten in Italy, but you're not going to be forgotten here in the U.S. To the extent that that transaction came through the U.S. and is re recorded on, it might have been reported in the, the New York Times or in, in any U.S. transaction, that that transaction is going to live, continue to live here in the U.S. And we'll take it off any search results in Italy so that, that if you appropriately petitioned for the right to be, re to be forgotten on this particular transaction, this particular fact point, in Italy, they've got an obligation to take you down and have you not, not returned in results on the google.it domain. But if you do that same exact search, and if you're in Italy and you go to google.com and not google.it, and you do the same search, that result will come up. Mm -hmm. uh, the EU has filed to have that be globally, so that if you come down off google.it, you have to come off everywhere. I think that's First of all, it's near impossible to practically implement given, sure. given the, the way the technology wor works here in the U.S. and the way uh, the internet works here in the U.S. Um, and fundamentally, our right to preserve information is just as good as anyone else's right to be forgotten. There is no right to be forgotten under the U.S. Constitution. We're very strong with our mm -hmm. constitutional laws. Sure. I don't recall a right to be forgotten. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I missed my that's constitutional true. law class. I apologize. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> so, you know, practically, I think there's no way that makes it across across the pond. I think it's it's horrible precedent even for them to begin to try and establish over there in the EU, and I I'm just dumbfounded by it. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. It will certainly go up. I'll start with the, the, the easy part first. It will certainly go up. Why it's so low is because I don't think they, um, f for a large part, companies don't fully understand the use that can be made of their data. There's a, the, again, the explosion, not just in terms of volume, but in the variety of data available to companies now is off the charts. And, and as I mentioned earlier, you've got, you've got biometric data streaming in, you've got supply chain data streaming in, you've got so broad a range of data avail now available to companies, both user-generated, customer-generated through their interactions with the company, and generated by the company's interaction with its business partners and its customers and its suppliers and what have you. There's such an increased volume and variety of data available to companies that most of them have not yet sat down and said, how do we ma best make use of this available data trove? Right? How, what, how can we improve on our supply chain by analyzing that data? Mm -hmm. How can we improve on our customer experience by interacting and in improving our use of, of this data? How can we improve on expanding into new products based on what we've seen customer behaviors being here? The, the volume has increased so dramatically and the variety has increased so dramatically. Most companies haven't sat down and said, we need a digital strategy to how to harvest and how to maximize the value that we derive of this asset. Data is an asset. Um, it, it can also be a liability in the wrong context, but, right. but data is, a, is an asset. Very few companies have a chief data officer. Most companies have a CIO at this point, but very few have a chief data officer. And if you think about that as a core asset of the company, there's a lot of value that can be derived from that, from, from banks and hospitals and virtually every, I mean, there are companies whose sole existence is just, they, they conduct no business themselves, they just broker the data amongst everyone and they make tons and tons of money. Uber is one of those. They don't actually do anything. All they do is connect your phone to some guy who's in a car out there. They don't do anything, mm -hmm. right? So they figured out how to, make, how to make value out of data just flowing to and fro. They have a chief data officer, by the way. Most companies out there don't have anyone who's truly focused on maximizing the value of the data that's available to that company. 
What about the other side, though, the, the risk side? Is there a vulnerability if companies are too dependent on big data and our analytics where there's, I don't want to say a terrorist attack, but a, but a breakdown in technology, in, in the technological infrastructure we have, is there a vulnerable? To come, can companies become too vulnerable if they're overly dependent on data? We, we have seen companies that, that don't have adequate protections in place and redundancies that expose right. themselves. And then yeah. when they have a, a failure, it really literally causes the business to stop or it causes them to stop being able to produce, to manufacture, to provide some service, what have you. Um, but that's, for the most part, that's all addressable with, with secondary and tertiary levels of redundancy, mm -hmm. right, throughout the computer systems. Having backups, not just to the physical data set being copied, but backup data providers and backup providers of inter intermediate services and what have you. And you can build enough redundancy around the provision of data services and of, of information services that you can probably safeguard yourself against anything short of a massive um, industry-wide sort of corruption of some sort. Mm -hmm. the, the one place where, where you, you can create a vulnerability or a risk or a liability, though, is over-retention of some data. And that is, you know, what's important to, to be able to maintain and, and leverage is specifically all the operational data, the transactional data that, that flows through the, the, the company. But you can keep too much email. Sure. Right. And, and, you know, you've got IRS regulations, what have you, or, or SEC regulations, what have you, putting restrictions on what you need to maintain. That's one area, though, where you're well advised to get rid of data as soon as you can. Right. Sure. Because 10 years down the road, nothing's good going to come from an old email. Right. That just right. doesn't happen. If there's sure. anything good coming from it, it came in the transactions. <laughs> right. We don't want to see the commentary that, that got to, you know, what convinced you to have this transaction or that transaction, that sort of thing. Yeah. So that's one area where, you know, too much data is not a good thing. You really do want to have sort of data governance policies in place that, that provide for the purge of that data as allowable under appropriate IRS or ICC regulations, that sort of thing. You know, and I think there's probably, when I think about, when I look at Harvard business cases that are available, whatever, there's, there are not very many cases that are dealing with those kind of issues sufficiently yet. Yeah. So, yeah, good. Other questions? Uh, yes? Can you get rid of that data? Yes. Um, and actually, as long as you do it, well, you mean can you technically? Is there a possible way of purging it all? Or do you mean are you allowed to reg, uh, under regulations and, and codes and such? There are, well, if you're, if you're using a, a server at an independent third party in Colorado who's operating in the cloud, maybe not. Um, but if you've got a sophisticated, if you're a you know, larger corporation, you've got a, a sophisticated IT security function, um, either if, you're, if your you know, emails are being hosted or if they're being operated on premise, what have you, you've got a good enough control there are, there are software tools that allow for, for you to provision and configure and restrict for the automatic you know, deletion of emails that satisfy X criteria on an automatic basis. It happens in the background, gets wiped from all occurrences. And, and so it can happen. It, it can be done. Um, Hillary didn't do it, but, but it can be done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes?
Big question. <laughs> it's a big question. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a long range question is, is really what it is. And I think you know, each of those economies, Germany, US, Japan, China, um, has its core strengths, its core attributes right now that are currently driving its economy. Um, but those, those develop over generations and they refine over generations and they adapt to whatever the, the external pressures on the, developing, the development of the economy are. And so in that, in that context, I think, yes, you know, American manufacturing is not going completely away. Actually, there's been a little bit of a resurgence. There's some, uh, you know, some connection to having local sourcing, which is uh, another external force influencing the economy that's driving the, the promotion of those sorts of ideas. Um, I think each of those economies will look very different as they adapt to risk management and, and analysis, as you said. There is risk, certainly, of doing business, as um, various entities have seen from, you know, a, across the, sure. the various economies, in having your operations too diversely flung, or having your supply chain too long, or having uh, parts of a car cross the border back and forth to Mexico too many times. Or there are risks all throughout. As you say, risk management is a key part of, of looking at how you might supply, fill your supply chain and, and build out your product. I, th I think the economies will adapt and they'll continue to evolve such that each of them will always try and develop, consciously or unconsciously, a competitive differentiator between the other parts of the, the, of the economies. And they'll continue to find a way to operate. I don't know that there's opti that it's optimal any place or ever. Okay. I'm not sure we'll ever get to an optimal economy. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Okay. Exxon has just been indicted for publishing This is this is the uh, the partial PowerPoint that was divulged that they disclosed where the um, uh, they had one internal scientist who said that maybe there is some climate change out there that, that the end is near and we should be concerned with it and notwithstanding the context of the much broader thing saying not really in the bigger picture not 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 a problem absolutely data is being politicized. And you know, we're seeing snippets of, well, A, we're seeing snippets of large documents, B, we're seeing snippets of large analyses, and it's very much being politicized to drive agendas. Mm -hmm. And every aspect of data is, is gonna continue. People are, data is available, it can be analyzed appropriately, it can be analyzed to whatever end you want, really. You can always find a way of spinning things. Um, there is certainly, that, that's a prime example of, I mean, Exxon published, I don't know how many research papers on the, uh, the risks of climate change. They disclosed the risk of climate change as a driver of their business and a risk to their business in, their, in all their SEC filings, what have you. Um, but this one little snippet, the, you know, the Times jumped on as, as being evidence that Enron was talking out of both sides of its mouth. Mm -hmm. And politicizing a point to the point of, of getting the DOJ to, to, to open an inquiry. That's a pretty, I would consider that more of an abuse of power than abuse of data, mm -hmm. honestly. Interesting. Well, if we had another hour, we could look at big data and how it in, could inform the political races that we're about to have now, but big data might trump the day. You never know, right? Trump so, the day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much thank for you. being here, and it's very insightful. Thank you very thank much. You.